Hello, and thank you for having me. I talk with my hands a lot, so I'm not quite sure how the microphone situation will go, but I'll try to keep it steady. So I'm just going to present uh, some baseline information that we have on a four-year project. It's a collaborative project with the Audio Order people. So um, we've got four years of data so far. And how we came to work in Barma Miller Forest is, as you know, it's Yorta Yorta, um traditional land. And, oh, sorry, I've gone too far. Oh, there's a lag. Um, and right inside that box there, smack bang in the middle, is Barma Miller Forest. So in terms of the species in the forest, we have three. The biggest one, Caledina expansa, is a broad-shelled turtle. And this is the totem species for the Yorta Yorta people, so it has a lot of cultural significance to them, which is uh, one of the main reasons how we came to work on these species. And the short neck species, Emigeria macquarie macquarie, uh, the only short neck species that we have, uh, a little bit aggressive too. And the third species, Caledina longicollis, which is another long neck species. So I suppose. Um, an important thing to note is that all these species have different habitat and diet preferences, and that can affect uh, how climatic changes, well, the effects that climate changes have on them and what roles that can play in how they recover and that type of thing. So essentially why this came about is because of the millennium drought. So a lot of the areas where some of these turtles were hanging out were starting to really constrict down to small refuge pools or dry out completely. So as a turtle, you have a couple of different options. You can leave before that happens, or you can be stuck there and hope that the water will stay until the next flush of water comes through. So because of the cultural significance of this turtle, this was a major issue for the Yorta Yorta people. Uh, it's their totem species, and everyone was worried because it was quite evident that there were a lot of turtles dying throughout the drought. So we came in and did um, a baseline study to begin with. So really, all we wanted to work out was I suppose the general health and status of the turtles, what was really happening in the forest and what role the drought was playing. And the other really important aspect of this was also to marry the indigenous and scientific knowledge together and see what we could learn off each other and how that might help develop the project. And in doing this, we were also providing opportunities for to capacity build within your deordination too. So mostly what I'll touch on today is uh, what's led on from our baseline data and what we found out from that. And I'll touch a little bit on some additional research that we've done with some GPS data loggers, but that'll be pretty light and fluffy, so don't worry. So to begin with, um, there's two aspects to our study. We have terrestrial surveys, which essentially uh, we go to a water body or to a river or wherever we want, we just go for a walk, really. That's the simple way of saying it. But what we're looking for is any signs of turtle that we can find, be it uh, nesting, dead turtles, live turtles, if you're lucky. And we quantify this. So what we have here is so you sure we um can everyone see the pointer? It's not very good. Anyway, so along this bar here is really just um the number of nests or shells that we find per person per kilometre per time, however we want to quantify it. And <coughs> the first year here, 2010, that's drought. So in all of my graphs, the first year that you'll see will be drought because every year after that the forest flooded. And the dark one, which is shells, or the number of dead turtles that we've found. So I suppose the important thing to note is that in 2010 and 2011, you have exact opposite happening. 2010, a lot of dead turtles found throughout the forest, and absolutely no nesting. No nesting found at all. 2011, absolute reverse. You've got very few dead turtles found, and nesting skyrockets. And I know that's a massive error bar, but that's just because there were preferred nesting sites compared to others, so there was a lot of variation. Now, if you were to look at that, you'd think, well, that's really clear. Uh, drought is really bad, flood is really great. Yay. Um, but I suppose the next year, 2012, was a little bit confusing for us. And unfortunately, we don't have the 2013 data yet because we haven't done the surveys. But you can see that there's an increase again in turtle mortality. And you would wonder, well, why is that? Perhaps the foxes know the turtles are coming out to nest now that there's water, so more are dying because of fox predation or some other factor that we just don't know about. And also you can see there's been a decrease in nests, a significant decrease. So um, I suppose for these data sets, getting a snapshot can be misleading. It can give you a really good indication of maybe the immediate effect of a flood, but what happens after that might not be very clear. And the other major thing that we look at is body condition through our aquatic survey. So we catch turtles, do a whole lot of measurements. 
and come up with a crazy graph like this. So what you're looking at is um, relative weight, which is just something that we use to look at turtle condition. So anything below 95 is considered to be poor. Anything between 95 and 100 is considered to be good condition. And anything above 100 is considered to be an excellent condition. So I'm just going to do this species by species. Um, and I'm sorry if I keep moving in front of you. I can't see very well. Um, so the broad-shelled turtle here. So the black bars and each of these represent drought and every year after that is flood. So broad-shelled turtle, you see that it's in good condition to excellent condition the whole way through, be it drought or flood, it doesn't change at all. It did have a slight increase, the first flood, but then it decreased back again and then it increased again. So what we're probably actually seeing there is just natural fluctuation within the population. And this makes sense because the broad-shelled turtle only likes permanent habitats. So if you're going to have a drought, it's going to be the, least spe uh, the species least likely to be affected because it's always where there's water. If we s just do a bit of a switcheroo down to the common long neck here, this was the one obviously that was um, had the greatest effect by the drought. Its body condition was very poor and had the biggest increase straight away the first year round. Um, first year of flood, massive increase, seriously significant, and it's dropped back again. Probably we would think it's plateauing and that it's reached its height and it's coming back down again. This immediate response makes sense because the common long neck turtle likes ephemeral habitats. So if you go somewhere in Barma Mill or Forest and you see something that's very ephemeral, very skanky, looks dirty, that's where they're going to be hanging out. They don't like competition of any sort, be it other turtles or fish, so they like to run off to the far reaches of the forest. This is a problem because in a drought, these are the first areas to dry out. You can either hunker down and stay there, but if you do that when the water bodies retract, that means you have a lot of competition. I think we caught like, I don't know, 17 turtles in one net from one very small pond. So you have competition with your own species. And then if you decide to move across land, it might be too late and you'll die anyway because you don't have enough body condition. Or if you move earlier, then you're in competition with the other two species. So your body condition decreases anyway. So this is a species where we saw the most marked change. And the short neck turtle, the last one, the Murray River turtle, during drought, we thought, well, they look a little bit affected, but it's not too bad. And we had a slight increase the first year. But as we keep surveying, we see increase after increase. So it's kind of telling us that perhaps we misunderstood. We thought these turtles might have been OK, but their body condition keeps going up. So it kind of tells us that perhaps we were a little too quick in our assumptions. And this makes sense because this species likes to inhabit both kind of habitat types, hangs out in a little bit of the skanky stuff, borderline, but prefers some of the permanent habitat as well. So you would, we assume that some of the population's being affected by the drought, while she still have some in those real permanent water bodies that are like, acting like refuges. Now, this is a bit of a crazy slide, I'm sorry, but um, it is a pretty straight Forward, all we want to do essentially is look at these dashed lines on each of these graphs. And this is going to represent size at sexual maturity for females. So all we're trying to show here, and unfortunately I don't have all four years of data, sorry, because I haven't had time to put it in, um, is that for some species you have little to no juvenile recruitment. So this is a major issue if you compare it to data that was collected in the 1970s near Yarrawonga, so not that very far away. And you have like only 3% for um, broad shell turtles, 7% for the common long neck, and 8% for the sh short neck species. I know it looks like we have more here, but in general we have um, captured a lot more turtles. So in comparison, the numbers are still pretty low. That's a decline uh, for some species of up to 20% in juvenile recruitment. So this is a major issue that I think we need to consider and look at. Uh, it's an issue because these are long-lived animals so you're going to have an adult population that persists for quite a long period of time. So everyone's going to say, oh, what are you talking about? There's turtles everywhere. That's not an issue. But you're really not going to know it's an issue until that ageing population starts to die. And then perhaps it might be too late. So that's kind of more the hardcore science. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about a pilot study that we did um, that was very exciting for us. And what we did is we were using technology that hasn't been used in Australia before, so we had someone develop it in the US for us. And what we wanted to do 
is we have a lot of issues surrounding turtles and a lot of unknowns and we get a lot of data and we make a lot of assumptions. These assumptions, if you were going to apply them to management, can obviously be quite dangerous because you want to make sure you're really reading your data correctly. <laughs> and a lot of the things that we don't understand about turtles is how the management of the forest is affecting them, be it for their movement, for their breeding, for their nesting, uh, preferred habitat that perhaps they're not going to get to because there's regulators in the way, movement up and down weirs, this type of thing. So we've developed... Um, a GPS data logger, which also has a little bit of a water switch down here, which will tell it when it's uh, underwater or not, because GPSs can't take a fix underwater. So we got 13 of these, and we fitted them in March 2012. And I suppose this is just a little bit of a story about how it all worked, and maybe highlighting that wildlife research never goes how you plan it to, especially when you're working with telemetry. So we set 13 turtles free, and then we tried to find them again a year later. And this was proving to be quite difficult. Some we haven't found at all, so I don't know where they've gone, but nowhere where I went. This involved uh, going up and down in boats, but also swimming through wetlands, hoping not to get your, your receiver wet. And when we did find some turtles, using traps didn't seem to solve our issue in getting them back. Turtles were uh, giving us a little bit of turtle attitude, saying, hell no. We know what happened last time we went in that trap and we're not going anywhere near. So um, after about five days in one wetland in particular, we thought, okay, we're gonna have to try something different. So kind of went a bit out of our comfort zone and got 35 meters of stop nets and decided that we would hand capture them. This was an interesting process. So what would happen is you'd get to a, like, uh, we started off in discrete water bodies, which was probably the best because the river was just hell. And you'll see that there's a line that goes all the way around this log here. What happened was we found a turtle under this log. So um, you can imagine some really serious hardcore scientists creeping around in the wetland, really quietly putting out our drop net, because if that turtle moved, we had to bring it all back in again and move it somewhere else. And we'd surround it, then we'd cable tie them all together. And after about an hour of doing that, we'd double check that it was still within the enclosed area and be like, oh, thank God. And then we'd all get in, with our receiver and pretty much chase the turtle for an hour and a half until someone bumped into it and we'd be like, yes! And we'd get very excited, very excited. So um, we did that for every single turtle that we caught. No turtle wanted to go into our traps again. So you can imagine in the river, in high flow, this was um, quite an exercise and I think we got pretty fit. So success to us was capturing eight of these, of the 13 that we released. And high levels of elevation, uh, elation following it immediately, and then perhaps a little bit of disappointment and, you know, maybe, you know, half an hour of crying. Uh, when we downloaded our transmitters and realised that all these zeros here really should be easting and northings. And we're like, oh my lord. So um, we had a few tense moments, a few tanties, um, a few phone calls to the US. And um, they've assured us that they're going to fix the issue, but of course that doesn't help us right now. But one of them did work, but I have other data, don't worry. And um, two minutes, thank you. And I suppose the one that did work showed us that this turtle was a total homebody. It might have come out a little bit to nest around here, but otherwise it visited the other end of the wetland a couple of times, but it stayed in exactly the same spot for the whole year. So that was very helpful. Lots of great data there. Um, but we did find something interesting because obviously when we track the turtles using the VHF, we have to find them. And one of our turtles moved great distances. We only put these on female turtles and you have to note that a study in South Australia found that female turtles only moved probably two to four kilometres. Our female turtles had a totally different idea. So um, it was caught down here. This is at Bulatali. And the next following year, it had travelled 11.27 k's up here. That's a minimum distance because I don't know if it went any further. And then by the time we came back in March, it had travelled another five k's back here. And then when the two k's, uh, the two days with us trying to catch it, it had travelled another four k's back down to where we released it again. So you know, it was off on a holiday, and um, I'm not quite sure why. And the other turtle that we are uh, went a minimum of nine k's, so it was released here at Yilama, went upstream, and then down Tongalong. So you have to think that's 11 k's upstream for the other turtle as well, down Tongalong. And when we found it down Tongalong, it was hell for leather going back down towards the river. So we actually failed to capture it, but um, I don't know, and we can't find it now, so I don't know where it's gone. <laughs> but um, 
I suppose it just shows that a little bit of knowledge from another system in particular can be a very dangerous thing because clearly our turtles don't fit their model and they're just doing whatever they want to do. So um, to finish up, I suppose one of my, I suppose the point I'd like everyone to understand is that turtles being a long-lived species, you need a long-term data set and you need real rigorous scientific data behind that if you're going to make assumptions and then apply that to management because you might get a snapshot and make the wrong assumption and then think, well, you know, that sounds pretty good to me and you could just go up the garden path. Obviously, for that, we need long-term funding. And I suppose some of the major issues that we really need to consider is fox predation and understanding nesting behaviour. So some studies along South Australia have found that 90% of the nests are taken by foxes. You have a long-lived species, there's not much recruitment, 90% is taken by foxes. What exactly does that mean and how does that play in with all the other factors that are affecting these turtles as well? And can we think, can we design something where you have a cost and time effective management tool to address that? And obviously our turtles like to move a lot. Tongalong Creek is the only creek that's not regulated. So what effect do all these regulators have on turtle movement? Can they get where they want to go? Maybe preferred nesting habitat, different seasons they might want to like the males might want to move to mate and then move back again. Are we kind of interfering with this as well? And I suppose because of everything that's going on and the low recruitment levels, I, don't th I think it's dangerous to assume that turtles are going to continue to persist in the current densities that we see them at now. So turtle densities are extremely high and they do have a big role to play in the ecosystem. So I think it's wise not to overlook that and that we need to think about management tools going into the future for them.